Hello everybody, I'm Michelle Garneau. I am Australian, but I live between Hong Kong and uh, Shanghai. I'm currently in Shanghai. In 2021, none of us are moving around all that much. Um, a little bit about my story. I am the oldest of nine children. My father died when I was a teenager and I dropped out of school, I had to, and then I ended up going back and finishing and I got a scholarship to go to university. I was not at all keen on going to university. My grandparents were very keen on me going to university. I had started waitressing basically, or working in restaurants, whether that was washing the dishes or doing whatever I could do at about the age of 14. And I actually loved working in restaurants. It was what I really loved to do. So anyway, I did go to university. I was very underappreciative of university. I now tell people who, you know, spend their lives saving or paying for their university education that we did a sit-in protest in 1976 six or 77, whenever it was, because the student union fees were $88 and it was all we had to pay, but we objected to paying $88. So it tells you a little bit about the different times. Anyway, I did not finish. I disappeared. 21 came. I was like, I'm out of here. And I got on a plane. If you come from Australia and anybody coming from Australia my age will know that like the big wide world was out there and it was a big wide world and in Australia there wasn't really uh, as much excitement, let's put it that way. So I spent a couple of years um, overseas and what we all called overseas. The last year of that in America, I hitchhiked from New York up, down, up to uh, Vermont, down to New Orleans and across to California. Um, that was a fascinating, fascinating time. And then I went back and I decided when I went back that I didn't care what I did, I just wanted to travel. So I went to the catering school because that was the school where you had to learn your IATA travel schedules. I looked at the travel course and thought, my God, I will die of boredom. All you have to do is know all of these airline routes around the world. It's like, oh, it looks awful. But I was at the catering school and I thought, well, I always really loved doing that. So I enrolled in a catering, a sort of catering management course. And that, that not very long into that, I started to cook. I was already working full time. So I was studying full time and working full time. But full time work was, you know, 50 hours a week and full time study was 12 hours a week or something like that. And I ended up then going back. I went to London, did a cooking class, went did a cooking school, went back to Australia and then decided to leave again. And I ended up in Hong Kong by accident. In Hong Kong, I just went to get a visa to go to China and I hated Hong Kong. I thought it was a horrible place. Oh, my God, it was just awful and it was so crowded and dirty and high and filthy buildings everywhere and, oh, my God, it was so noisy and, oh, I couldn't bear the whole thing. But then I got a job because it was one of the few places. This was 1984. It was one of the few places in Asia I'd run out of money. I was, you know, I was getting a bit too old to be bumming around the world and feeling a bit sort of sorry for myself. I got a job. I then stayed on in that job. I went off to Europe a couple of years later, two or three years later, I went to Europe. And then I, I think when I went to Europe and I spent six months in Italy, I sort of really understood how the opportunities were really in the new world and not the old world. So I sort of had this romantic idea that, you know, life in Italy and in a small village and running a restaurant and, oh, that must have been fantastic. And I think when I got there and the reality of it was really, mm, Hong Kong is such an exciting place. And so I went back to Hong Kong and I had a boyfriend at the time who was a chef and he wanted to open a restaurant. Anyway, he ended up, so I yelled at him the whole time saying, this crazy idea, open a restaurant, you're mad. What do you want to open a restaurant for? You're crazy. So we, we worked on this project together and then we got fairly, you know, sort of far down the line. We didn't have any money, so money was like, oh, never mind, we'll worry about the money later. But, you know, we've got all the ideas, we haven't got any money. And... Um, and then he got really sick and he needed to have a heart transplant. Um, the good news on that is that he has since had 
another heart transplant. He's had two heart transplants and he's going strong and he's still a chef and we're still friends. Anyway, we're obviously not a couple, but we're still friends. So I decided to go back to Hong Kong. I went back to Australia with him. I decided to go back to Hong Kong and open the restaurant, which I did. I had very strong views of what I wanted to do. You know, at the time in Hong Kong in the late 80s, there was very high-end restaurants or very sort of, you know, like a pub um, or, you know, La Bella Donna Napoli restaurant where all of the Chinese waiters sang Bella Napoli to you when you walked in the door sort of thing. You know, it was a bit bit cheesy. Um, and I decided that I wanted to open something more modern with good food, but I didn't want it to be so fussy and it couldn't be too expensive or too, you know, too much carry on about sort of like blah, blah. So when when we opened in 89, it was really pretty revolutionary. It was a new sort of thing. And I think in many ways I was very lucky to be in the right time at the right place with the right product. And so I opened, it was a big success. It was a nightmare, of course. I mean, running a business, I borrowed all the money, um, you know, but anyway, I was lucky. And you know, lucky and hard work, you know, it wasn't just luck, you know, you need a little bit of luck. And that's what I say, you need a little bit of luck, but a little bit of luck is just a little bit of luck. It's the hard work that really makes something successful or not successful. So, you know, moving down along the line, already I was involved and I've always sort of been involved in sort of community projects. So I was involved in community projects. The governor, the last governor, Chris Patton, came to the restaurant for dinner and I had the, the courage to go over and say, oh, hello, um, Mr. Patton, you know, very nice to meet you. I run, I also work with a not-for-profit organisation. Can we do a dinner at your house? I'll do it, I'll do, I'll do it, but can we use your, you know, government house to do it? And he said, well, let me have a think about that. Why don't you approach so-and-so? So we did, we did a big fundraising dinner for a group called Hipong Society in Hong Kong. Hipong dealt with children with various handicaps under five years old before they went to school. Great organisation. Anyway, so, you know, I'm bringing in the community stuff. By the time the mid-90s came, we'd organised a protest against the French for um, testing nuclear weapons in the Atoll Islands. I was exhausted after that and said, I think I might just go to Shanghai for a week's holiday. And I came to Shanghai with our restaurant manager and he said, we should open a restaurant here. Five years later, we finally opened a restaurant in Shanghai. And I think in many ways it was a lot of hard work, but it was also, again, it was the luck to be in the right place at the right time with the right product. And, you know, we were very successful in that early time. And there wasn't much competition because what we'd done was sort of fairly new. So, you know, moving on from that, so that's the base. So for me, you know, the running of a restaurant, a restaurant for me is a place of community. For me, a restaurant is about hospitality. Hospitality is about caring about people, um, making sure that food's good, the service is good. It's all aspects. And having cooked for quite a while, you know, I had, and you know, been involved with lots of chefs, it was very much, it's not only about food. Chefs think it's only about food. You know, sommeliers think it's only about the wine list. And the restaurant manager and the maitre d' think it's only about the service. But, of course, it's not. You know, it's all of those things. So once you get all of that right and you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time with the right product, I think for me it's like, okay, well, what else do you do? We've got this M space and how do you use it? How do you utilise it? So already done quite a lot of literary things or music or fundraisers. In Hong Kong, we were part of, of the Fringe Club, which was a sort of an alternative arts organisation. And so they did a Fringe Festival every year. So we had various artists perform. We had cabaret and readings and poets and famous writers and you know, small acts and all sorts of things. And so for me, that just sort of continued. And I think that just grew over the years. So in 20, uh, in um, around the turn, so, uh, 2001, we had changed an area. It's a big restaurant, M on the Bund, and we changed at the back sort of part of it. And we started to do various talks and various things with the different consulates, especially with the Irish. The Irish 
consul general at the time was not really very interested in trade. He, he's now retired, so I can say this, but he was saying, I don't really care about trade. Culture's the only thing that's important. So I love this idea. Culture's the only thing that's important. And he, so he brought lots of Irish sort of um, performers, poets, uh, writers, traditional musicians, and we basically became this venue for this to happen. And that's sort of the beginning of how we started a literary festival that went for, it, I say it went, I mean, it probably will revive itself later this year, but we didn't do last year, very, very sadly. It was all organised, had to be cancelled. Um, we did 18 years of Shanghai International Literary Festival. Last night I had dinner with um, the gang the people that I set up the Shanghai Chamber Music Lovers Festival with. So um, he is a Singaporean guy who teaches chamber music at the Shanghai Conservatory of Music. And in 2009, we set up um, a festival and a competition for chamber musicians. Um, and that now actually has a life of its own. It now is taken over by the Conservatories of Music, which is, you know, we're very proud of. We still do chamber music, so we still have chamber music at least four or five times a year. Um, we do lots of talks. We do a series of talks. We do lots of different subjects. We do, you know, we've done everything from food security to sort of sustainability to preservation, I mean, doing, running a literary festival, of course, you cover many topics, but at the moment I'm working on two or three different streams of talks. One is called The Future Of, with a whole pile of young people who just are so enthusiastic about it. It's fantastic. And we're looking at the future of whatever. The first one we're doing is future of transport and then the future of agriculture. And the you can think of anything, the future of AI, the future of medicine, the future of humanity, you know. Being in China, we avoid politics. We just really just avoid politics. It's, um, it's the safest way to not offend anybody anywhere in the world. So, and the other one that I'm working with, with um, some Duke University people who want to showcase their, the knowledge of their faculty. Um, and one of the first talks that we're doing on that is with a woman who is an expert on, actually she's an expert on champagne. So she wrote a book on champagne and how it is intrinsically tied to French identity. So actually how the French took champagne and tied it into their identity. And I think champagne was one of the first products that um, by law, you're not allowed to use the word champagne if you're not from champagne. So it was something that started that. And she's a professor who teaches at Kunshan University, Duke University, and Kunshan is a, um, uh, a sort of satellite city of Shanghai, about you know, 20 minutes on the fast train, probably an hour and a half to drive, but literally 17 minutes on the fast train. So, you know, for me, that's what's really exciting. You know, I still work with the chef on the menus. You know, we had a super challenging year last year, of course. I think everybody did, especially in our industry. Food and beverage industry has been really hard hit. It's still a bit volatile at the moment. It's sort of like everything's like crazy and then it's like, you know, so it's a bit of a roller coaster. But luckily for us, we've had good years. And it's interesting thinking about your ideas, Bob, that that who taught you things? I was speaking to my godson, who's French, who has grown up in Los Angeles, and I said to him, yeah, it's a really tough year. And he said, how long have you been there? And I said, yeah, this is our 22nd year in business. And he said, so in all those 22 years, have you had, you know, pretty good years? And I said, well, yeah, yeah I suppose so. Yeah, actually, Actually, of 22 years, we've had 20 that have been excellent. And one, when we had to close and renovate, we were closed for two months. That was a bit of a tough year. And then last year, and he said, well, that's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, 22 years of business, you've only had two that have been tough. And I thought that's such an interesting way. He has no idea about business, but I thought that's such an interesting way to look at it. And I think it made me feel... You know, just sort of thought, yeah, it's true. You know, I've had 32 years of running restaurant business 
Uh, we had a restaurant in Beijing. That was a much bigger challenge. And I closed that after eight years. When its lease came up, I closed it. But it still, it was fascinating, you know, fascinating experience. So, you know, that's sort of where we are today. And actually, I think, I still feel that, you know, a restaurant is a community place. I mean, either a restaurant is a, is a McDonald's where, you know, you go because it is what it is, um, or it's a big Chinese restaurant where you go for family reasons, or it's a local little community. You know, China still has a lot of small local restaurants that also don't cost very much. You know, it's one of the remarkable things about living in a place like Shanghai. You can eat and it doesn't cost for I mean, our restaurant's quite expensive, but it doesn't cost very much. Very small community places. You know, and that's sort of what a restaurant should be. For me, it's the essence of what hospitality is. So that's really where we come from with our body, mind and soul sort of ideas. Yeah.